Hi everyone, it's Natalie here and welcome to my series on the Mariel Tarot. And um, yeah, we're looking at the structure of the Mariel Tarot. We finish the threes with the three of discs and then of course we move on to the four of wands. <laughs> where, you know, you can see that she's she's taking some of this rich gold color, this rich orange, and she moves it from here directly to here. So as we move from discs back to wands again and go one, two, three, four, um, she's carried that idea over from one to the next. And so here we have what looks like a tree which is on fire. Such a rich um, image in so many different ways. So I'd like to talk first about all of them, all of them here. We'll put them all down um, and look at the look at the landscapes here. So as you see, I've called this the landscapes of the fours or the landscape of the fours. Um, These images that go from, you know, sort of all over the place, and we'll take this one out. This is because I know some people are working with um, a first edition. Actively using landscape here to describe the fours. You know, we have essentially what looks like a forest fire. Um, the after effects of a giant bolt of lightning that strikes the earth, starts a fire, sends the flames, you know, upward to the heavens. And almost as though you're gathering, you know, it's coming from the ground up, because that's usually how fires in a forest or anywhere else start. Um, and then it's taking the energy of the sun and coming back down into earth with it, right? We move on to the Four of Swords. And what do you have after, and I'm sorry to say, oh, um, I can't help but think as I'm talking about this, about, you know, the bushfires that are, are currently happening in Australia. And I will talk a little bit more about that as we, um, as we progress forward. So if you're watching this, you know, in future, this was filmed in 2020, um, you know, we'll probably be remembering the bushfires that took place in January, you know, December, January of, of 2019 and 2020 and into February, of course, and hopefully they will begin to slow down um, any minute now. But yeah, it is, it's really relevant at the moment that this is being filmed. Um, but you know, what we have here in the form of these clouds, you know, is interestingly what is capable of creating the lightning that strikes the earth and she talks about that in great length in in the guidebook but we also have potentially the kind of smoke that billows up <clears throat> and fills the air after such a fire um, something that you know, I did not notice straight away when I first saw this card, right? This looks like these are cumulonimbus clouds that are ready to burst forth with water um, or with lightning, you know, and either it could, could go um, either way, right? We could get one or the other. We could get lightning or we could get water. Um, but either way, it is full of this potential and yet nothing is happening yet things seem things are ultimately quiet ultimately peaceful um my mother noticed the first thing when when i first brought these cards out her eye went down here <laughs> again i know that titles are necessary i hate that they have to cover there's a couple of things in you know they cover this gorgeous shell um, in the Four of Cups, which I also don't like. But, you know, these are details that are actually really important to these cards. So in this one, you know, just as we have something that is potentially very cleansing and pure and purifying, 
we also have a toxifying, you know, effect coming into it. But when you compare the toxicity coming from these two little stacks down here with the enormity of the, you know, potential inside these clouds, regardless of what happens when they come down, it makes the pollution here look like a fart in a whirlwind. You know, the pollution seems almost to get lost. And yet, it may very well be affecting what's happening here in the Four of Swords. There's so much I can say about these cards. Oh my gosh. Um, and I'm trying not to get overwhelmed as I start to try and talk about them. That is not an easy task. <laughs> I'll just be totally honest. Um, then we have the Four of Cups, right? All of this potential here you know, these, these rain-seeded clouds burst forth and we have this flood. This tremendous flood. And through this flood, we have this gorgeous um, conch shell down here. You know, there are so many different um, worldviews that hold, hold a shell like this as, as utterly precious. Um, interestingly, that also includes Tibetan Buddhism, which is fascinating because they're thousands of miles from the sea and, uh, and in the mountains, nowhere near it. So imagine, you know, if you're that landlocked and up high, finding something like this or having it brought to you is, it would be utterly divine. Even if you live on the ocean, I know that for people who go out and beachcomb every day, finding a shell of this beauty and, and magnitude, you I mean, it would still be pretty stinking awesome. You'd still pick it up and take it with you, probably, um, and find it irresistible to you know not to do so. But interestingly, too, it's safe from all of this maelstrom happening back here. You know, this water is shaping the land. Um, and yet, in the midst of all of this happening, you know, this, this is still, this is calm, it's safe. Very interesting. So these, these first three are about, they're not balanced. You know, they're fours. And despite the fact that we think of fours as being controlled, balanced, managed, holding on to things and so forth, we're getting a lot more, um, there's a lot more going on here. You know, they're not, they're not perfectly harmonious yet. Um, they're, they're more balanced than the threes in some respects, but, you know, they're going to become unbalanced again when we get to the fives. And it's interesting to me, too. You know, the three, three is a fascinating number. Anyone who has tables, you, you know, or has a three-legged table, you can probably vouch for this. Um, three-legged tables tend not uh, to be unbalanced very easily. A four-legged table, however, can be very easily unbalanced. It's a funny thing. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a very funny thing. I'm saying that. I'm trying to remember if that's exactly true. <clears throat> I seem to, you know, there's, there is a structure in, well, yeah, no, that's, I mean, think about it. We have, I was about to pull it out and, well, why not? I keep this here on my desk for when I need to do videos um, using a phone or if I, I'm doing a, a reading with my phone for FaceTime or such, you know, other things like that. This is a tripod. It's a very, very um, balanced structure, right? It tends not to tip around. But there's a reason why it's a tripod and it's not a quadrupod. You know, the, the, the structure of that three interestingly, has a, a, a unique form of stability to it that you would seem to think would happen in a four, but isn't always part of it, right? So we get that sense of like grounded, you know, this one is, 
you know, this tree is, has roots. There's something about it that's grounded. The fire and the way the fire is ravaging it makes it unstable or less stable, let's say. Um, this Four of Swords, you know, is it's stable in the sense that it seems solid. It looks solid. Those are solid clouds, <laughs> right? But they're, it's not entirely... You know, it's the calm before the storm is what we're seeing here. We're seeing the potential for things to unleash and go crazy, which, of course, happens in the five. Um, or we see it happen in the next four where we see the four of cups. And this is definitely not stable. And yet there are stabilizing ele elements in it. I was about to say elephants. But, yeah, there are stabilizing elements present in this four. You know, we see that the earth is here, and ultimately, no matter what the water does, the earth may be, it will never be the same. You know, it's being shaped by the waves and, and the, the emotions that are present here. Um, but ultimately, what we're seeing is, is that something here is, is solid, and it, and it is immovable, regardless of what happens around it. Um, coming back to the Four of Swords, if we think of this as an analogy of the mind and of meditation, it's really interesting from that perspective. That is not a perspective that Marie White offers. This is coming just through through my own um, my own experience of meditation and of, of different analogies that are used by meditation teachers. Um, in Zen, this is a frequent analogy, okay? To think of the mind as a blue sky. Sometimes in that blue sky, there is a lot of activity, okay? There's a lot going on um, and a lot happening. Even though there are clouds, the blue purity of the sky is still there. Even though there are a lot of thoughts happening, there's a lot of movement, a lot of um, tension, a lot of uh, fertility, a lot of seeds, uh, a lot going on, possibly even some toxicity and toxic thoughts. Um, what you find here is ultimately a mind that is still not corrupted by it, right? It's just the nature of the way the mind works. The same way that this is the nature of the way the sky works. <clears throat> skies get clouds, skies get precipitation, they have birds that fly around in them, airplanes, we pour pollution into them and so forth. In some respect, it's still a clear sky. To some extent, we have control over that factor. I'm trying not to go into a big, long talk about meditation. It's really hard not to do. Um, you know, we, have, we have control over how much poison goes in. But there's also the possibility of being able to trust the process here. That, you know, in the same way that the clouds in this sky at this moment, in this place, at this time, are going to be resolved... Um, in some form or other, by waiting and giving space for that to happen, it, it happens. You know, that's why my keyword for this one, for the Four of Swords, is fertile retreat. These are fertile clouds. They're full of, you know, rain and water and all sorts of things, uh, possible lightning. There's a little bit of gold in here. If you look closely at her painting of this, there's just a little tinge of gold in, in here, in and around. Gold paint. Um, you know, it, it, is the, it holds the seeds of enlightenment within it. And she even speaks about a lightning strike that comes down and hits the earth. 
Um, and in fact, let's just have a look. There's a couple of things I want to read. And we'll get to the Four of Discs in a moment. <clears throat> it's the end of the journey. So I feel like spending more time on the earlier parts of the journey is necessary. Um, what she says about the Four of Wands... Uh, interestingly, actually, I will, I'll just pull my book out here, right? She says, first and foremost, innocent babe in the three of discs, your wrappings are a little warm. <laughs> okay, so this happens to be one whereby she definitely is taking the three of discs and weaving it into the four of wands. Okay, she's definitely moving. She's, she's doing that in a way that's very transparent. And so the flames and the color of the flames, if you look closely at your Four of Wands, they're coming out from behind this tree right at the edges. Um, they're the same shades that we find in, you know, in the Three of Discs. Okay, so, and who knows how many years apart she painted these who knows? I mean, there she painted the entire deck over the over the course of uh, ten years. So we don't know, you know, how many years are behind that. Um, <clears throat> so that's the first thing that she says. Um, she then goes on and talks about how the three of wands. Let me pull this up here. So the three of wands sent the serpent up to give the sun a big wet kiss and invite it down into her cold black space. Submitting, the sun followed, lighting up the shaft of the center pillar like a, a giant torch. Okay, a light and a flame the pillar burns. Your creative energy coming down. Sexual energy coming down. Find a place to put it and make it warm. Okay, so this is all going back up. This is coming back down. Um, create, love, have passion, transform. Take the energy and change something in the world with it. Ground it, grow roots, send it into the rocks and soil, and fondle the worms. Okay, and then she says, burning away your old life or self, using it as power, energy, and fuel to feed the next part of your life. Also, a fiery demon you will bat. I mean, she, she jumps around a lot. <laughs> There's so much that she puts in here. Um, but, but ultimately, you know, this one is very, very much about grounding the energy that you need to use in order to fully transform. This one is kicking off that process. This is, She talks about the kundalini moving up the spine. She's thinking of this eye as being like the sun. Um, and then, you know, bringing that energy back down, you know, from something that's kind of like tree branches in the sun to literal tree branches and sun and fire. Okay. When she moves on to uh, the Four of Swords, she says a lot of really interesting things. Um, she talks about the number four, as you saw me, I had penciled in there, you know, as being a number of earth. Um, and she talks about how she wondered, always wondered why the four, um, you know, is the emperor and not the empress. So why is the emperor four, but the empress is three and vice versa? Because she found that she genderizes fours. Um, and then after a time she spent, you know, looking at it, thinking about it, examining it, she realized, um, you know, that those are things that are, are really subjective and very dependent upon culture, right? So <clears throat> with that said, I'm trying to find ways to summarize this. You can always go back to your books and have a read. I really, really strongly recommend it, especially look at um, what she writes in the Four of Swords, because a lot of times what she's doing, you get like a very short, um, very short one for Four of Cups and a very long one for Four of Swords. That's in, that's in, I don't know how intentional that is, but she's including a lot of the information about the Four of Cups and the Four of Swords, you know. Um, 
these are intended, you know, very, very much to be read uh, as belonging, you know, being part of one another and being part of a process that extends across all of the fours, all of the threes, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, let's see. Yeah, so as she was trying to figure out how um, how to represent the fours, right? Because she was seeing them as feminine, but the, um, you know, the emperor is very masculine, obviously. How do you then represent all of these you know, how do you represent these fours without, without losing anything and without changing anything, right? Because she wanted to stay very, very true to the structure of tarot as it is. Um, so she says something very interesting here. I'll just put our emperor down for a second. Um, she says, and this is on page 91, everybody. Uh, she says, I found myself at some point uh, mm, let's see, I've, I've misquoted that. She says, I committed myself at some point to using the symbols as found in tarot in the major arcana rather than trying to alter them or rectify them with any system I might know. So I did not compare and fix. I learned from what was. And what was was a male emperor standing for the prime number of earth element and physical universe. Okay. Um, she also then said that, you know, when, when she got to the four of swords, which is the, the one I'm reading from that's on page 91. Um, <clears throat> she said that, uh, she says that definitions within the symbology of tarot are fluid and expansive. And she realized then that she couldn't say that the earth is more male than female. Um, and it, she clearly had a lot of mind opening, you know, mind opening experiences and thoughts that came across. Um, yeah. So then she said, you know, that, that ultimately a symbol has a core of truth that we understand through our external experience. And so it's an interplay between truth and observer. So she's offered us, through the use of these landscapes, some interplay between truth and observer. The openness, the expanse that's here, gives us the opportunity to reconcile, as you were seeing here with me, you know, talking about the analogy of meditation. Um or rather, talking about the analogy uh, of, of a sky, right? Of using the sky in place of the mind, you know, symbolize the mind in meditation. This is the truth, right? Um, and that I'm seeing as the observer. This is such an open, possible space, right? So much here, so much is possible in all of these that the truth in these cards in my experience is, you know, is something that evolves and emerges depending on the client, depending on the circumstance, um, and depending on, of course, all of the other cards around them. Okay. Let's see, what else do we have? Um, <clears throat> yeah, she, she also goes into a very lengthy diatribe um, on page 92 where she talks about gender and she talks, you know, she does a lot in, in the deck anyway um, about the sex as, as symbolic of, um, of union and integration. Um, and she talks a lot about the symbolism that you find here in the with the emperor and his his sword. Um, and when she's specifically talking about this four of swords, she talks about lightning. And she says here on page ninety three, actually now, um, that quote lightning is the semen of God, 
The earth is the womb where it will root and grow. The same is true for our minds and souls. And that also is what led me to feeling okay with with comparing this to to the functions of a mind. Obviously, it's a four of swords too, but you know, using that um, analogy for meditation really works here. Uh, you know, for so many reasons, and not just because that's my my interpretation or what I see, but it's also. Um, what she has written. Interesting. She then goes on in in uh, on page ninety three. Still, still in the swords here, right? Still in the swords. She she's talking about the birth of something precious, and it reminds her, or it's in part for her about the birth of Aphrodite. You know, out of the waves. So she talks about how um, Aphrodite, and then we can put in a little ellipsis here. Um, is is the beautiful pearlescent shell washed ashore that you will stoop down, pick up, put in your pocket, having no idea how relevant it truly is, and then you will begin walking on the path that is your destiny and will lead you to your star. Um, and whether she's talking about our literal star, right, because she says star here, now is where I'm going to have to pull out some additional cards. So whether she's talking about, good thing I have them here and in order so I can find them, whether she's talking about your star, right, is in the Merkaba, or whether she's talking about the star, which interestingly looks a little bit, it's kind of an Aphrodite rising up out of the waves, okay? It has some some of that feel to it. You know, she's talking about, I feel, this is where she's talking about um, the tetragrammaton. Okay, and, and or what I what I'm using as an analogy for the tetragrammaton, right? Signs along the path. Um, mystical interactions that take place between you and your environment. Um, I guess this is something I integrated and took in and absorbed in a way that I didn't realize because as I'm talking about this and went back to my book today, this was the first time I really pulled all this together and went, oh, that's probably where I got that from. Um, because I keep reading the book over and over and over again. It's so dense. Uh, the text is so dense. There's so much in there. It's worth continuing to mine for information. All right. But she talks, obviously, here about, you know, this being something that you find on your path. So she's talking about that mystical interaction. Um, the Tetragrammaton spread, of course, do I have it here? Is it on the back of this? Where did I put it? Yeah, it's here. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, you know, this is four. Four letters. So the purity of the way that she's presenting these fours and their relationship to transformation feels really, really important to me in terms of understanding, um, understanding what our path is, where it's leading us to, um, what you know, how we interact with it, what we find, what it brings to us. Um, etc. In fact, what she says here, let's see. All right, so the bottom of 93 um, in the first column, again, a really dense, very, very densely packed paragraph. Um, she says, now, <laughs> all caps, now, <laughs> she said so much already, as you stand in the desert, um, Right where she said of the Empress, the camel, the place where God is not right. So in a in a dark place, right in the abyss, um, with the electricity of the storm pricking the hairs on the back of your neck and the hot wind caressing your skin, you are the earth, and God strikes his semen into it slash you, impregnating it slash you 
with your soul, right? The nugget of gold, which from here you forever work to mine from the black rock of yourself. The four of cups and the four of discs. So if we look at that as an analogy of mining, what do you do when you mine? Well, you, you often use water to sluice away and wash away at the rocks, right? So this is not the gold, right? The, the four of cups, this, this shell is not the gold. This shell is a sign along the path that you're getting close to mining away and getting to the gold. She says in the, on 96, the shell from the Four of Cups is the star on the Four of Discs. The heavens are within. So in the same way that the emotions and so forth, everything that we do in our lives that washes, that ultimately helps us to mine, you know, whether it's an external force, an internal force, etc., whatever it is that mines away at our self, right, to get to that source, to get to that purity within us, by the time we get to the discs and we're walking through a valley, right, where things have been mined away, <laughs> Wa you know, this has been heavily washed away over centuries, millennia, in fact. As we get to the four of discs and the storm has receded, we're able, you know, there's something beautiful in that. And the star becomes the symbol of something that is now internal. We've taken this precious thing here. And we figured out, oh, that precious thing that I thought was outside of me actually lives inside of me. It's no longer outside. It's actually been inside of me the whole time. But isn't it amazing how we need the external environment? We need the space of landscape, of interaction with the earth. Um, and with its elements to get to the place where we can understand that what we're seeing outside of us isn't really outside. It's a metaphor for something or a symbol that, that is a metaphor for something that's ultimately within us. It's telling us who we already are. So I think... Um, the best way then for us to understand <clears throat> the role then, at least within the Mariel Tarot, at least within Marie White's vision of the emperor and how he functions, is as a being or an aspect of us that is able to take all four of the elements, okay, and bring a more solid structure to them. So we have the structure of the three, which is so solid. Remember my analogy about the um, tripod. The only thing more strong than that would be to take those threes and increase them to four and make them three-dimensional. So that's why I have my pyramid out, right? So we have the wisdom of a pyramid, of, the per, of a pyramidal structure, okay, that, you know, has all of the genius of a square, which is four-sided, four-pointed, combined with the brilliance and the, mo the mobility of a three, and the stability of a three. It's using the stability of the three by increasing it to four. You know, pyramid is an incredible structure. We know this. And through landscape, instead of getting the shape, you know, instead of getting a two-dimensional shape, through the use of landscape, she's giving us, you know, three dimensions 
just giving us structure um, of material de of, of material reality in its highest form, in its most stable, structured potential. This four-sided object has the capacity to use all four elements. Um, simultaneously, she's represented, you know, there's water, there's fire, there's earth, there's air. You know, these elements are all represented here within our emperor. And the emperor has the capacity. Remember the thing about, you know, the lightning strike and about impregnating the earth? We have that here. But you see this time the emperor is in control of, of that and of that process. So by the time we get to this four on some level, okay, notice the similarity in color and possible landscape um, and the sort of cool feel. By the time we get here, you know, and we've internalized a lot of this and realized that we've had the capacity to use the external world in order to understand the internal part of ourselves, we have the ability then to structure and manage what it is that we do with all of these elements and the way they manifest in our lives, right? How do we take them and make use of that possibility, of the possibility offered to us through these elements? Something else that Marie White also says in the book, right? She does speak uh, on page 25 in her description of the emperor about how all four elements are described here. She also talks about fours as a portal. So those, uh, those of you out there who may be um, purists, you know, where it comes to fours, um, especially the Four of Wands, right, which usually has that wonderful, like, um, hupa. Is that what it's called? I think that's what it's called. But, you know, it's got, you know, the Four of, so you know, these are, you guys are all tarot enthusi enthusiasts, what am I saying, right? So you know the tar the Four of, of um, Wands in, in the RWS is a sort of portal. It's, it's going from one world, it's an initiation, so what we have here is an initiation. It's a miracle in so many ways how a tree can survive a forest fire. Miraculous. And somehow, you know, because it's rooted, because it's grounded, it has the ability to withstand the fire and transform into a better version of itself. It's, it's, it's miraculous, and we do too. We have the ability to withstand the pollution of the mind, the pollution of the environment, the chemicals, the things that come about, the bad thoughts, the difficult moments, uh, the clouded mind, the foggy thoughts, um, the dark thoughts, the, the feeling of, of total abandonment, um, and be washed pure. We can wash the smoke, the pollution, etc. out of the air through the, through the process of the way water functions, the water cycle. And, be, and have it washed away and be pure. We can, <clears throat> we can suffer, you know, the maelstrom of emotions that washes away at the, at the source, at the idea, the identity of who we are in a way that utterly transforms us and begins, doesn't necessarily have clarity yet, but begins to give us clues, even as we're in the midst of it. 
And at some point, we come out of it. We start to walk out of that valley and into the light and recognize that that precious jewel, that pearl of wisdom, that little something that we picked up along the path that was so precious, that's taken, you know, millennia within our souls, within our bodies, within the environment around us, to integrate itself, has now integrated into us. And from there, we can structure it, we can manage, we can bring our worldly lives into greater harmony and into greater balance. And we can do it within nature and in a way that is, um, that's beautiful. So there are the fours, everybody. There are the fours. A little bit longer this week, so forgive me for that, but I think maybe worth it. Hopefully worth it. Um, there's, as always, there's a lot more to it. There's always more that I could share. Um, always. But, uh, you know, for now, this is enough. This is enough. Okay. So I think next week we will look first at the Hierophant. I have a whole video ready to go for the Hierophant. And then we'll look at the fives. All right. Thank you so much for being here. I hope this is useful to you. Um, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.